Hello and welcome to the Promised Land, a show about Manchester United and part of the Night Him In podcast network. I'm Scott Saunders, joined by Rob Blanchett as per usual, but something, if you're watching on YouTube today, looks a little bit different, doesn't mm. it, Rob? Uh, Yo, are you first... talking about my jacket or my hat or something? I think it might be your jacket, actually. <laughs> that's not different. That's the same old Rob for forever. That's, that's what it is. But yeah, I can see the difference, Scott, in where you are. Tell us a little bit about it. Uh, we have moved into a new studio at Night Him In Towers. There is a new studio space for the Night Min YouTube channel, and this is a new podcast space for the podcast that we produce. This is the the home uh, for the Promised Land podcast, for Harry's Chronicles of Aguna podcast, and anything else we might record as well. So uh, fantastic. I hope you like it. Uh, this is the first uh, real run through that we've had with this. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify, please get over to YouTube and have a look at just how good this looks. Hopefully it sounds okay as well. But uh, Scott and Rob back again after Manchester United draw with Liverpool at Old Trafford. Rob was there. It was the craziest game I've seen since Thursday, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's the craziest Man United have played since every game this season. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> this, this football club is a basket case at the moment. It really is. And uh, we'll break down that game today. We'll talk about Willy Cambuala's performance. We'll talk about Kobe Mainu. We'll talk about the result, what that means for United's season. Casemiro's done some talking as well, so we'll break that down as well. And I'm having to just get to get used to the fact that I'm looking down a different camera lens to where I'm looking at Rob. So if I if I'm not looking down the camera lens at you, if you're watching on YouTube, sorry, I'm looking at Rob because he's he's on my screen, which is in front of me. But guys, uh, this is the Promised Land podcast. As we say, please subscribe if you haven't subscribed already on Apple and Spotify for the audio on YouTube as well. You can find us the Promised Land and Manchester United podcast. Please uh, join the channel, leave a comment for us, let us know how the new studio looks on our end, and uh, let us know your thoughts on the Liverpool game. I don't think United have another game now for... till next weekend, is it? They're out of Europe, uh, they're out of... Yes, it is. Bournemouth yeah. away. Bournemouth away. Oh, that's a, that's a tricky one, isn't it? <laughs> Aren't they all? <laughs> yeah, they're always tricky. But yes, please, uh, please subscribe on all your major podcast platforms and on YouTube as well. Leave a comment subscribe, et cetera, et cetera. And hit the notification bell so you never miss a show and follow us on social media at double underscore Scott Saunders, at underscore Rob underscore B, and at TBLMUFC for all of the Promised Land podcasts on video. Right, you were there at Old Trafford, Rob. Mm. That was must have been a hell of an experience, i got to say, because the first half, Man United were absolutely annihilated by Liverpool to the point where they didn't have a shot on goal i want to say in the first half whereas liverpool mm -hmm. should have been far and away clear they should have wrapped the game up and then obviously man united being well that they had a helping hand didn't they from kwanzaa uh and bruno fernandez with one of the most miraculous goals i think uh we've seen in in a good few years at old trafford but they turned it around as well kobe menu came in and scored an absolute screamer echoes of uh federico makeda's goal against aston villa mm -hmm. But obviously, United couldn't hold on. So, classic United. It really was. Questionable penalty. I think you, I saw you do a tweet last night which uh, suggested you didn't think it was a penalty. But, Rob, tell us about your experience on the day. Well, it was very Manchester United, as you said. And, you know, from my seat at Old Trafford where I'm there year after year, it feels like the same game on repeat, whoever you're playing. It's just the way it goes, doesn't it? So you saw, with, I think, with this with this football match, is that pretty uh, very, very early on in the game, it felt like United were going to have to do something special in this match. You know, be moments FC like we've said that they are in the past. Uh, and that's kind of how it all panned out, really. And, you know, if you're a Liverpool fan or if you're Jurgen Klopp, you're probably not happy with a, with a two-all draw because you had the opportunities to do it. And United gave you those opportunities in, you know, in mass, isn't it? So uh, one thing it is, Scott, is that, you know, I'm sure Man United have become this season the, the neutral's favourite football club because it's just chaos. It's wild. And I think now we've got almost preconditioned to it. So it's like, I'm expecting this at Old Trafford. I'm not expecting United to be like, you know, in control of their own faculties. I'm expecting this style of football. So I don't think it's going to change for the rest of the season at all. Um, but I actually think United, in the bits that they had, Scott, they did okay. It's just that they still just give so much away of a, of a normal football match in terms of tactics and their spacing. And you, you got away with it. It's the way maybe to put it to all. I think I was happy with that. And at half time, I'd have taken to all every day of the week. No doubt about it. 
no, no, nothing in terms of the advancement of Manchester United, but it was a very, very entertaining game of football. <laughs> entertaining for, you know... That's a nice way of putting it. It's, it's a nice way of putting it. Obviously, the Chelsea game was very entertaining as well, full of goals, but the the tactical issues that I think have been dragging United down for the entire season were there for all to see. Liverpool, mm. I tweeted that I don't think Liverpool will make the same mistakes as they made in the FA Cup tie three weeks ago. And it turns out that that was a pretty naive thing to say because they did. They kind of did. Yeah, they really did. And I think how much uh, satisfaction do you take out of the fact that United have really dented Liverpool's title hopes, as tin pot as that sounds? Well, I don't like saying I'm one of those fans. Do you know what I mean? But I've said in the past that for all the years when we were winning stuff and people would come up to me and say, oh, you know, we we helped stop you do that. We helped stop you win that Premier League. We, we beat you in an FA Cup final. Oh, we beat you in a League Cup final. Well done, you guys. You know, but ultimately, it's, I've never really been bothered about that. Now Man United are where they are in the last 10 years. And obviously, our competitors are doing better than us. You feel it, don't you? Like yesterday, I felt it, you know, and and the two all at the end of that game, obviously, even though you gave that lead away pretty late in the day, felt quite good. Felt quite good because you saw Jürgen over the other side from us, not looking very happy. And the Liverpool fans were not very animated in the corner near us on that side. And yeah, if Liverpool lose the title by a point, we'll look back on that day, won't we? And people will remember Kobe Manu spinning on the edge of the box, putting the ball in the top corner. And it was a magical, magical moment to be there and actually see that. Um, but yeah, we don't want to kind of measure ourselves by those things, Scott, but it's quite funny. Yeah, really quite funny. If you're, um, if you're watching on YouTube, we have had some lighting issues <laughs> throughout the show so far. But give, forgive me, this is a this is a first time run through. It looks like um, you've gone like late night, Scott. It's like, yeah, you know, like you're, late... you're hosting your own show at midnight. Yeah. On a, <laughs> on a commercial radio station somewhere. And it's kind of like, you've got that kind of glow about you where you, you're about to take callers, like press the button and say, you know, it's John from Hereford. Please tell us what you think about Manchester United. <laughs> we got, we got Johnny in the background who's uh, been helping or been essentially all credit to him for setting up the studio space and for setting up the podcast space. Uh, I think he's all right. He's, uh, but th there's no solution here. We just have to, we'll have to get through. You can still see me anyway. You can still oh, see me. Very, I'm just one, very seeable. One, it's one side of my face is lit. <laughs> uh, the other side. Well, there we go. So That's oh, better. there we go. Some, something's changed there, Johnny. But <laughs> right. Uh, let's let's crack on anyway, Johnny. Don't worry about it. I think we're um. I think we're, we're all good, good here. Yeah. We are all good. Let's uh let's run into the meat of it. I suppose. Where do you want to start? Because. You know, I think that weekend with Tottenham winning and obviously Villa drew, but we already knew like United aren't finishing any higher than sixth, barring a miracle. They could tumble down the league. The the teams beneath them have been have started catching up with them now as well. So United could potentially, especially if they lose to Bournemouth at the weekend, mm. which is a possibility, it really is, could start to tumble even further down than sixth, which is not going to look good, obviously. Uh, but no. there's an FA Cup semi-final coming. It, it It is now almost like the FA Cup's the only thing to really play for. But then there's different European places as well. How important is sixth place, do you think? It's not important. Not at all. I'm, I'm mentally shut off now from, from the Premier League the league position. I am like, yeah, great. You want to end up as high as you can. But as we are just saying, we've just done a, a an opening segment about the dysfunction of Manchester United. We've done about 30 shows about the dysfunction of Manchester United. What is the point in saying, well, maybe if they play better, they'll end up higher up in the league. So that's the way I look at it now is that you've got a chance to win the FA Cup. That's cool. You know, you're in the last four. And obviously, when we get to that point, we'll, we'll discuss that further. But I think, Scott, when you look at it, you know, you saw that game against Liverpool and because that replays over and over again, tactically, I've got, I've become numb to it. I'm like, when I'm there now, I don't get annoyed about it anymore. I don't kind of go, but why can't they just press? Why can't they just keep the, I'm just sat there now. I'm like, well, okay, if we win the game, great. If we don't win the game, we'll address that when that happens. And let's see where we go from there. So kind of like a two all against Liverpool once upon a time, Scott, where you've given maybe some play away and some goals away. I feel a little, a little bit bad about that. I'm not. All I'm thinking about was great goal by Bruno, great goal by Cobby, and Liverpool might not win the league because of that. And it's like slim pickings, but my God, I'll take it. So uh, where do we start from? I, think, I guess Bruno's goal. Now, mistake from Liverpool defender Gerald Quanta, yeah. obviously. But 
when obviously you were there, Rob, so I was watching on the telly and yeah. I think most people who were watching on the telly just saw that pass and then saw Bruno run onto it. And it was, you, you saw that he was just going to shoot straight off. And obviously mm. with the television angle, you don't have the foresight of being able to see Kelleher is way out of his goal. Yeah. So I think a lot of people looked at it and then thought, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> what are you doing? But he <laughs> just cuts underneath it. If Kelleher actually saves it and handballs it, then he, he might get a red card. Yeah. Uh, so maybe it was better off that he didn't actually do that. But the goal was, uh, reminded me a bit of Cavani a couple of years ago. Yeah. A little bit. Um, But that was so out of the blue, <laughs> honestly. It really was. United had nothing and it was relying on a, a mistake from Liverpool to get them back into the game. But then obviously the pitch had changed completely and United, having had no shots in the first half, had their first shot, scored their first got, uh, shot with a goal mm. and then it just it just spun on its head completely. Yeah, it was a crazy moment. Like uh, uh, My seat at Old Trafford is just to one side of, of the halfway line towards the Stratford end and it was almost directly in line with, the, with how he gave the pass away and a strange pass obviously cut it inside to nobody there was no one there Liverpool out of their own shape uh in that moment which they did rectify through the match but for Bruno Bruno was kind of again level with us and and my first instinct was don't hit it run like there was loads of space in front of him to run towards the goal but he clipped it and then you kind of noticed as you said that, that Keller was out of his goal and well out of his goal and there was that moment where you thought is it going to clear the goalkeeper you know is it going to actually be on target is it going to go wide and until it actually hit the back of the net, you just didn't feel it was going in. <laughs> you just you just thought this is going wide, or you know it's such a difficult skill. But credit to Bruno because I think that is the flair move. That's something that Bruno can do. That's what his mind is ga- engaged towards. Um, and you take the opportunity, Scott. Like you just said, there, United had nothing up until that point. They really, they really had very little. Um, Again, if we wanted to make this show about tactics and all of those things, it's still very strange how United set up in these moments, but they are there for those moments. That's it. One big moment, can you take your opportunity? And yes, so United had two really great moments and took those opportunity, and you nearly won the game. Like, you know, I said, we'll talk a little bit about the, the penalty uh, afterwards, but I think when you look at it overall, maybe that's all Man United have got these days, Scott. Like, I think that's what Eric Tenard thinks he's got really doing his locker is that create special moments and work hard and try and try and make the opponent make the mistake because I think that's where where Liverpool have had that downfall when they've been to Old Trafford now the last two times. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of frustration, obviously, but I think for me personally, I'm just watching it. I, I, t- I tend to chuckle my way through United games at the moment. <laughs> and I, I was at Stamford Bridge in the press box on, on Thursday night and I just spent my entire my entire spell in the game just well most of it anyway just laughing at the craziness it would go at one end it would go at the other and yeah. there was no midfield that existed and obviously for the first half of that game that was the case for like a couple of minutes at the start mm. but then Liverpool just assumed control completely yeah. United could have scored actually if Garnacho had held his run or if Bruno passed it earlier within the first minute or two and obviously that game might have had a completely different picture on it from the yeah. very beginning but you know that's kind of I'm not I'm not too disappointed because I'm not really expecting everything to magically fix that that's just what this iteration of United are yeah that's how and I it's feel. not gonna it's not gonna change until something changes exactly and I think this is why when we talk about the wider topic of United or even going into transfer market now at the end of the season or what Ten Hag does or whether Ten Hag stays or goes and all that all of that has a massive impact on that in terms of looking at the wider philosophy going down the road but when you look at it now like we just see this all the time. Like you just said, they mentioned at Bournemouth and Bournemouth being a kind of difficult, dangerous game. Well, the truth is, is that when your squad is worth a billion quid or whatever you've spent on it and you've got, you know, arguably you wanted to go and get one of the most progressive, elite thinking managers in the game in Europe and you've gone and got that guy two years into a project, you would like to be able to go to Bournemouth, wouldn't you, Scott, and say, well, let's just, just turn up and win. But, that isn't Man United, is it? That's not this Man United. We've not got there. We're nowhere near that. Uh, I think it's quite interesting as well with Liverpool in that game, Scott, is that you, you can see that even though Liverpool you know, are in this title race, for me, they have weaknesses. But what you see the difference is that when Van Dijk's got the ball, Liverpool are beautifully spaced. In, from the from the touchline where I sat, you can see it so clearly that I don't think a TV shows at all, a TV camera. And it's, it's elite training. It's that they've got that, rammed into them and it doesn't matter if it's one of the kids or a Bradley or Kwanzaa or those kind of players they know the job 
and they're doing the job. I think that's why Liverpool feel kind of a bit hard done by. Because when you look at United in comparison, when Maguire's got the ball, United look like a hot mess. You don't know who's supposed to be what, playing what position. Delo seems to play seven different positions every week. You know, I always mention Delo. I know, sorry, Diogo, it's not your fault. Um, you know, Aaron Wambasaka as well, kind of in multiple positions. You kind of think, I don't know how they're supposed to do this job. Um, but there is some shining light. She said, like, Garnaccio mentioned it. I think Cobby is like the one-man midfield. <laughs> he just He's the one who seems to do normal things. Um, and on the day, you know, I think Bruno did okay. Marcus maybe not so okay. But that's the kind of assessment that we're having to give every every week, isn't it? It's the same things. And how will it change? I don't know. Does it change with new signings or does it change with a new manager? Uh, I think the jury's out at the moment. you just got to kind of let these next games happen and see where the cards fall because... I don't know, Scott, like fifth is, I think, unthinkable for Man United. And then it's kind of like, where do you end up in the pack when it's shuffled? I think it's probably where United are at the moment. I think don't, I can't see they're having a mad run towards the end of the season. We run into Arsenal, don't we, with the second last game of the season? Mm -hmm. I think Arsenal are going to be pretty motivated for that game. I'm sure United might be as well, but United might go, well, we don't want Liverpool City to win the title. So... So that might be another game chalked off there. You'd think they should be professional, but you, it does happen in football. Don't question their professionalism and integrity, Rob. Never. <laughs> Never. Um, but Jurgen Klopp said in his post-match, if United play like they did today against Arsenal, Arsenal will win. I <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think that was a bit of mind games, actually. Um, but Fergie did it, didn't he? Years yeah, ago. Yeah, Fergie leagues. did it as well. Fergie did yeah. it as well. But you mentioned Cobby. Um mm. Just unbelievable. What was your angle behind that? Because that was so satisfying. Like, uh, like I mentioned about um, the the comparison with Makeda's goal against Aston Villa in two thousand nine. Yeah. United have actually put a a video overlay on. It. Have you seen it? Yeah, if you haven't seen yeah, it already, go over to United's channels. Um, it's a overlay of Maynard's goal and Makeda's goal, and they they're absolutely identical. It's crazy, really, yeah. to see how how identical they are. That's the first thing I thought of when I saw it as well. But Kobe Mainu, just in general, the fact that he can come up with that at such a big moment mm. in a game. I know United, they were on the crest of a wave at that point in the game. Uh, it was just such a technique-wise. It, it just sums up the kid, really, doesn't it? Totally. He's just, there's no fear. And he's so assured in his own faculties about how he's supposed to play the game when he's got you know, for the majority of the season, these kind of older, wiser, on a lot of money players around him who are struggling, he doesn't seem to really struggle. He might might go one pass astray or something like that, Scott, but he has a, such an ability to have a corrective uh, kind of idea of his own game. Like, he knows, I, I did that, now I need to do this. Uh, when you just said there about the goal from K Kiko Makeda, uh, I was sat in exactly that spot, that kind of same seat that I watched that goal from in real time in against Aston Villa. And I remember when he came on against Villa and put that in the top corner. And that was obviously such a massive goal in the context of United winning a title. And then when you looked at, um, at Kobe when he got that there, I was feeling a little bit, not jaded at that point, but I was thinking, how are United really going to, like, do something in this game because they're so bad at the moment. And when that ball came across, it was from, I think it was from Wamasaka, and he took a kind of touch on his left. I, as I was kind of level where Bruno scored his goal from a little bit to the right towards the Stratford end, he knew what he was going to do straight away. He knew it because he rolled that ball. You, you saw it and you were like, it's going in the top corner. And I felt that straight away. It's like, he's going to hit this, it's going to be on target, and the goalkeeper is going to have to make a special save. And in the blink of an eye, you know, flick of a switch, that's how you feel and you think. And the way it just curled inside, it hit the net. We had a beautiful view of it, and pl the place went mad. Like the place went absolutely mad. Not just because of the way that you know the goal went in or anything like that, but just to see one of our kids doing it on the biggest stage, someone that we've got faith in and that we want to see play every week. Uh, Kobe Man is the real deal. But my God, we knew it before this game. We know it in the future. Build the whole midfield around him. Whatever you do now, he has got to be the guy. He is your future captain. He's going to do great things for England as well. Uh, and it was just a, a special moment. And I liked his celebration, Scott, when he ran to the corner flag towards us on that side. He's just like, mm, yeah, it's me. It's who I am. Yeah, this is me being me. And and there's a lot of love for it because I, I we we need players like this, don't we, Scott? We need players that just are brave but also technical, good at what they do. 
Um, he was fantastic yesterday, but he he always is, and he's an automatic starter now, isn't he? Already, like how many games into his career? Twenty five, something like that. You know, you wouldn't drop Kobe Manu for anybody at Manchester United, as it sounds. Yeah, he's going to be a mainstay. I think you look at the qualities that he's got, and then if you're building a midfield next season, maybe at least one of those players are going to change in that midfield. Casemiro we'll talk about later. Yeah. Um, depends who the manager is, obviously, but maybe. Yeah. Obviously, the question's been there about Bruno and his uh, capability in the eight or in the ten. Yeah. What happens there? Obviously, he's the captain. So, you know, that will be a much more surprising one than, say, Casemiro leaving the club or being replaced. But you see what Manu's got. He can play in the six, can play the eight, can do, can score goals like he scored against Wolves, can, like he scored against Liverpool. Hmm. you got to buy players with qualities that will supplement what Kobe can do. Yeah. And like you say, Rob, I think future captain is, is, I think it's nailed on. It really is. If uh, avoiding injuries and that kind of thing, he has the mentality for it. He's got the quality for it. And it's a, he's a real gem uh, to find out at the Academy and maybe we'll talk about the Academy a little bit later on as well. Cause uh, I, I was a good week fully, for it. I was fully prepared to come into this, uh, this show and just start talking about the nine, one win over Liverpool's under 18s because the, yeah. the first team have been absolutely smashed by Liverpool's first team. But <laughs> Rob, so disappointingly, although not surprisingly, in the last, uh, it's, it's about nine, ten days now, United have scored a 96th minute winner at Brentford uh, through Mason Mount in possibly the best moment of his season. Yeah. He's had an awful season. It, w- it was the best moment of his season. It really was. Mm. And then gone down the other end, being stupid, have conceded an equaliser within a minute or two. Then they go to Chelsea, and I tweeted this yesterday. They go to Chelsea... They go 2-0 down. They come back to 3-2. Anthony with one of the best moments in the United shirt that he's had. Like yeah. top three, top five probably because he scored some important goals as well. Mm. But that assist for Garnacho is incredible. And then yeah. Chelsea go down the other end in the in the 10th minute of injury time and score twice because yeah. United are just being silly. And then Kobe Mainu scores potentially one of the best winning goals you'll ever see against Liverpool. And then United go down the other end and we'll talk about the penalty now. But... Mm. Wambasaka being on the floor in the first place makes the referee uh, make a decision. And unfortunately, it went against him, didn't it? Yeah. Like, like, I think it's one of those things, like, to me, that was a typical Aaron Wambasaka moment. That's that's his game, isn't it? I need to tackle someone. My legs will extend. I can do it. That's why he's nicknamed the spider. And he tries to reach for it. And there's no doubt he doesn't really make contact with the ball. I think the thing is with that penalty, and this is this thing, it's really not, you know, sour grapes. It isn't. I'll just try and explain myself with VAR and where I kind of stand on it. Is that in the stadium, again, from my angle, I thought it was a penalty all day, every day. Why? Because I'm looking at the player. He, he does dive in. He kind of comes in from the side. Um, let's be honest. Harvey Elliott does a really good job of doing what he needs to do, which is initiate the contact. Um, you know, Allah, Jack Grealish or someone like that, who are also these players that are really good at initiating contact and getting fouls. Um Yes, I think the, the the argument you can say on one hand is stay on your feet, Aaron, but he doesn't do that anyway. That is his game. And Man United lean into that at times for him to make those tackles. And he made some one or two stellar tackles again in that match. I think the thing is, Scott, so I think this is going to be a little bit of a VAR rant. I'll try and keep it as simple as possible. The whole idea about VAR was that for moments like that, that we can kind of scrutinize something very, very quickly and make the correct decision. And when you look at the replay and you look at from the main camera angle, in the main leg, it comes across where he's reaching for the ball. He doesn't make any contact with the player. And then you have to work out if the trailing leg takes the player down. And what you actually see quite clearly is that Harvey Elliott deliberately steps to the right, even though it's out of his, his run path. He's running to kind of out of the box again. He t- puts his right foot there to initiate the contact. You can say that wan might be out of control. But the whole idea of it is, Scott, is that you're supposed to be able to analyse that very quickly. And if you're looking at it, I think if the referee goes to the monitor, just on his own to look at it, I think if he looks at that, he doesn't give a penalty. Because it's not, it's not, it's not enough contact, and I think the whole thing is that yeah, Wamsaka don't dive in, but we know that he does. When you look at it, and it, you don't have to look at it long. Like I looked at it after the game very quickly because I was like, it's definitely a penalty, and then I looked at it straight away and I went, well, it's not a penalty, is it? 
No, because he, he moves into his path line. Because that's in that's all part of the the, the mandate now of the rule book is that players are not allowed to move into the path line. You know, it, it's a fact, case that Wan is making an honest attempts at the ball, and yeah, pe other people like Stonewall penalty. I think fans have been trained now to think like this because there's a leaning towards this of how, of how the rules are. And and the PGMRL do not help it because they've told people this is what it is. Yet you'll see that Scott next week and it won't be a penalty. You'll see it in another game and not it could be Man United, it could be exactly the same play, it could be Wan Bissaka again, and someone will say it's a good tackle. Yeah, you'll say. And that's the problem now is that no one has a clue. Well, I said this earlier today. The penalty that was given against United against Rasmus Hoyland in the Manchester derby earlier in the season. I've seen that foul 10 times since that happened with no penalty yeah. given. Yeah. Like, it's, it's just... I feel so tired of talking about refereeing decisions and the rules Rubbish. and how inconsistent yeah. they are. I've just had enough. I, I really have. <laughs> yeah. um, with VAR decisions, like, like VAR say? was about that, was to help. And VAR now just, just defers. So, like, there I get why VAR doesn't overturn the call because that's the mandate given by the PGMOL. But the truth is, is that was what we wanted it for. It's that like referee can go to a monitor and say, right, let me just double check this. It'll take me 10 seconds. But what happens? We get four minutes of just nothingness while they draw lines and look at things and look at angles and all this. And then they go play on. So I think VAR is failing at the moment. And I'm a VAR guy. I want VAR to be in, in, installed. I still want that. And yet people telling me straight off the game yesterday, Scott, our VAR's ruined the game. It's not humans, but it's the referees that have ruined it, and it's the PGMOL. So, yeah, it's kind of such a dull subject, isn't it? But technology should make things easier, not more difficult. Uh, speaking of technology, if you're still watching along, uh, we've had some uh, lighting uh, difficulties. Uh, so I, I've my <laughs> I've just changed again, <laughs> Johnny. But bless him, was trying his best, but. Uh, these Keep going, ones, Scott. Uh, it's, all, it's all well. No one minds. Five minutes, no one so, minds. Hey, I mean, for the last five minutes, I've had a, a light flickering to my left, <laughs> which is uh, finally gone off. But hey, um, you can uh, you can watch us on YouTube if you'd like to see uh, the lighting issues that we're having and see the new studio at the Promised Land of Manchester United podcast. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the video, leave a comment for us as well. And uh, Apple and Spotify is where you can find us on audio platforms. Please give us a five star review. Has to be five stars, nothing else, please. Yes, uh, because stars, please. we we try and do our very best to give you a, a measured ish take on whatever's happening at United. But um, right, Rob, Willie Camboala got the call up to start yes. alongside Harry Maguire at right centre back, given Johnny Evans, Rafa Varan, Lisandro Martinez. Mm -hmm. Who else? Is that it? That's Victor it, Lindelof. It? Maguire, Lindelof. Are all injured. Luke Shaw, maybe you can put in Luke as well. Shaw, as a Luke Shaw can play in there as well, obviously. Auxiliary centre back. So that, that's a lot of injuries. And mm. uh, Camboala made his second Premier League start, his first at Old Trafford mm. in the Premier League. Uh, the first one he played in was a defeat at West Ham just before Christmas or just after Christmas. I can't remember what it was exactly. But he came in. Big day for him, obviously. Yeah. Liverpool have their own. Uh, young centre back in Kwanzaa, and obviously have Bradley there, who's uh, done an admirable job stepping up as well. Looks very talented, but you know, Liverpool are well coached and well run. <laughs> no, no, exactly what they're doing. Uh, so maybe it's a little bit easier to slot in. Whereas in a Man United defence, you don't have really any protection from the midfield. So um, bit of a daunting task for him, but he did brilliantly, didn't he? he really did. He really did well. He, he did us proud, Scott. He really did us proud. I had a conversation before, like on the uh, traveling over to Old Trafford, um, about about Willy Camboala. And there's this kind of feeling, isn't it? It's like, oh, well, is, is he good enough for Man United? And and I always say the same thing. Well, how do you know until you see him? Like, you, you, I've, you I've been know. in that camp, by the way. I've been in that camp. Like, with, well, with, with Manu, you can just see it. But obviously, yeah. if you're a center back, it's, it's a little, more diff little bit more difficult. You know? A little bit more difficult, but I think the thing is, is that when you look at a centre back, especially when you're looking at maybe when players are coming through their teenage years and maybe making that that move into the early twenties, is that you've got to look at the kind of physical attributes as well, as well as the technical, and do they mesh? I think the thing is with Willie Cambuala for a pretty long time they have they're they're there like he has got all of the gifts you need to go and be a very very good center back but i think the thing is as well scott is that this is the whole thing about the season about the complaints about oh injuries here injuries there with the older players and whatnot is that you've got this guy here 
whatever you should be doing, you should be giving him minutes. Yeah, it's got to be like that. This is how you build culture, and this is how you build a proper squad. Yeah, you know, I don't know if Campbell is going to be a starter at Man United in years to come, but in that little snapshot you saw there, is that he has got the talent. He's got the talent. There was that moment there as well, Scott, when he gave the ball away kind of on the right wing area and Liverpool kind of streamed towards the box and he he chased back like a like a lion, absolutely going st- back to his own goal and he made a tackle right right near the, the edge of the six-yard box. And I don't know if you saw it when he got up and he went absolutely mad in front of the Stretford end. Absolutely mad, hands in the air like he'd scored a goal. And the reaction in the stadium, again, was beautiful. Because everyone knew what he was feeling and we felt it and we all did it together. We all screamed like we'd scored a goal. And that's just from this young lad who's taking his opportunity and fighting for the badge. So I'm all about that. That's what I want to see more of. I'm not bothered if Varane's fit or not fit or someone's doing this or the other or Lindelof wants to play or not. Play the kids. Play the kids because they're going to give you upside in years to come. And yeah, then going to transfer market and you find ways to to balance those things in in scum. We know with Ten Hag, see Scott, it's like he's not really like that, is he? Like he's very conservative coach. And I think he would literally, if he had any hair, be pulling it out thinking he had to start Cambuala against Liverpool. Uh, and you saw he was quite often up against Salah or in that side or in, in that channel. And he did great because he's he's got it. He's got what you need. Um, very two and Zabi like. So we know that with Axel Two and Sabi, it didn't work for him at Man United, and we know the reasons for that. Cambuala's also had injuries. But I think while you're in this kind of run now to the end of the season, Scott, just, just go with it. Have some faith. Put the put these kids in, use them if you've got them there on the bench, and push on. Like to see maybe Harry Amas get a game before the end of the season. He was there on the bench, very young, obviously, very green. But what are we waiting for? So we can come fourth, uh, sorry, not fourth, like fifth, sixth or seventh. That's why I'm not thinking about the league table. I'm thinking more about the squad development and the team development because that's still really, really important. I mean, it remains to be seen if uh, Cambuala will be a mainstay in the United squad over the years to come, like we can see with with Garnaccio and with Maynou. Uh, yeah. But, you know, just to see him get essentially thrown in at the deep end because United had no other choice and to mm-hmm. see him, you know, really swim... And, yeah. you know, you, you mentioned the, the moment where he kind of jumped up and gave it a big fist bump, fist pump. He was quite composed, though, at the same time, you know, and he, he, mm. he had that nice, ba- nice balance of, uh, you know, feeling the emotion of the occasion, but also, yeah. you know, displaying qualities that you'd want to see in a centre back, uh, because we, we've seen Man United, many Man United centre backs over the last few years just mm. really not have that kind of, uh, you know, composure or drive or... Well, they've got hands behind the back, Scott, in the box. Yeah. Like, look, yeah. I'm doing the impression now. That's, I hate it. I see it all the time. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> like close the ball down instead, rather than just like, I'm going to stand still and be a statue. But I think the thing as well with Cambuala, just to kind of put a cap on that, is, is that you, you, you see this. That's the biggest day of his life, his debut against Liverpool. And you see people's faculties in that moment. You see what they really are because he could have withered completely. And we've seen plenty of players do that in the past. Remember the Patrice Evra's debut against against Man City? Yeah, the first 45 minutes he got pulled and he withered and he's talked about that in the past. I mean, he became a great footballer later on down the line. Um, but I think with Kambala, I, I think he's got it already. You just need to keep developing it and that means minutes. You have to play him. He deserves minutes. And while you've got these injuries, why complain about it? Like, just Get him on a pitch, put him in a shirt, and tell him to go do the job and give him the elite training that he needs to become better. You say elite training. Eric. <laughs> you also called him a, conserv- a conservative coach earlier. I just wanted to pull you up on that. He's quite cavalier in his in the tactics that he's showing at the moment. C- ca- conservative in the sense of range. So I think he gets an idea and he's just like, that's what I'm doing. There isn't another idea. It's like, this is this is how I'm going to play football. It's funny because that's the whole idea. Is that the, the thing about United being Cavalier, that's kind of all they are. They, they're, they're really not anything else, are they? They're not technical at all. They can't, They still can't keep a football. They still don't know how to kill games. They still don't know how to... I mean, we can go on forever, couldn't we, with that? That's what I mean by that. And he seems to do it. Look, what do we get towards the end of the game, Scott? Scott McTominay coming on with 10 minutes ago. It's the same thing repackaged over and over again so that's this is not i don't want to have a go at eric about this because i think i think the whole thing is that his players are still playing from there's no doubt about that and i don't know maybe you can stumble over something maybe you can find a way in these final games just that we go into them don't we just watching the same thing so it's very difficult to comment differently on it 
Would you prefer? I said this early, uh, either you earlier today or yesterday. Would you prefer he kind of went back to the the tactical style of last season and like because it was it, there was no real discernible style there. Maybe you can argue the same thing now, but if anything, the style is that United are just chaotic and hmm. you know high intensity, but also then just they play high intensity really well for about twenty minutes during any period of a game, and the rest yeah. of it they get dominated. Um, would you prefer Ten Hag kind of went more back? towards last season to pick results up because United was sturdy and solid at that at that point and obviously some people criticised him for not really having an idea but United were hard to beat and this season they're not at all I think, I think if you compare last season to this season my god it's night and day it's not the same sport is it last year you were serious you had serious tactics you knew what you were doing you developed something and you found a way through the hub of Casemiro and Eriksen. You found a way to look after games. And Man United went, what, 28 games with Casemiro, Eriksen and Bruno as your midfield free, playing a 4-1-5. And it worked because you climbed the table and you went from looking like you were failing to something better. This year, Scott, has been exactly the opposite. Just completely the opposite of that. Is that you had an idea, you didn't develop it, you got some injuries. It got worse. It still keeps getting worse. It's still getting worse. It's still getting worse. I think we're going to end the season in a kind of such a bad place when it comes to the tactical elements of Manchester United. Is that being this chaotic is not sustainable. It will get you sacked. Just as simple as that. And I think that's the whole thing with it, Scott. Is that I absolutely prefer last season, one hundred percent. Can we go back now? But you know, but we did get to the League Cup final. We won that League Cup final, and they were not good for the final ten games of the season or whatever it was after that. And I still feel like we're in that maybe, I don't know, malaise from there. Like they, 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 but I also think the manager feels that this is the only way to win games is through being chaotic. You just said there, Scott. You can do it for twenty minutes. I think that's kind. Sometimes I think they can do it for 10, 15 in a game. And sometimes that gets you a result. But most of the time, it gets you beaten. And that's why Man United are where they are in the league table this year. That's why you got beaten in the Champions League, Scott. You were the better team in most of those games. You went out at the first stage. So it doesn't add up, does it? Last season was a, was a much better season, I think. Because you, you set your stall out. You were trying to build stuff. This year, you've just been trying to burn it all down. Well, you could argue that tried to play a certain way for the first two matches and then pivoted and completely changed because yeah. he thought, oh God, I can't actually do this. Whereas this season, it's just been like, ah, well, let's just give it a go anyway. He Whatever. had Brentford, didn't he? The 4 nil at Brentford made him go, ah, I'm going to get done here. I need to sort this out. And he did it. And and this year, we, we went to Brentford, Scott. And as you said, some of the metrics showed that we were worse than the 4 nil, <laughs> And that's frightening, isn't it? Kind of go, oh, we shouldn't really be worse. And then now a year on, it does happen. I know that, but... Um, yeah, it's difficult for Eric because I think he's he's now between a rock and a hard place that he's trying to save his job through some of this. And he thinks it's just about results. And I agree with that. But he could win the FA Cup, like I said. He could even end up as high as possible in the league. He might still get sacked because this style of football doesn't win you anything, really, doesn't. It might, might make the neutral happy when they watch Man United. But I saw Sir Jim there. He was in front of us yes, uh, yesterday at the game. I really like that, that he's in the stands and you can see him. He's very visible he's not watching it going, oh, that was fun. <laughs> he's watching it going, how can we make this better? How can we make sure that Man United play proper football? Because we haven't done it for a while, Scott. I can't remember the last game where I felt that we just managed a game and won it convincingly and all of that. Can you give me a, a time when that happened? I can't think of it at all this season. That's all. Can you? Crystal Palace <laughs> in the League Cup which, were, oh, which we, we looked at and then thought, oh God, that might actually, I think, they, I think it's clicked now. With rotation. What's that? With rotation. With like six yeah, players yeah. rotated. And it was when Bruno was on the bench and Marcus was on the bench. And United were really good, weren't they? You're right. That's the last time I can kind of remember where we we put it together and it felt nice. Like it was like, ah, oh, that's this is good tactics. But United haven't really tried to do that ever since. Right. A couple more topics left of today's show. Mm. United's first team are, God knows what they are. But the under-18s, right? They've provided some real quality into the first team over the past couple of years. Won the Youth Cup uh, a couple of years ago now, was it? Yeah. And this season, Gone, they are this season they are ahead at the, well, at the top of their league. And at the weekend, beat Liverpool 9-1. The under-18s beat Liverpool 9-1. And there's some good quality in there. There's a, it, there's a lot of hope, I suppose, but as bad as it looks at the top level at sometimes, 
that maybe at academy level they're starting to get things right and that we've already seen two, three players come from the academy into the first team. So maybe the pathway has been opened for more to come through. Harry Amas, you mentioned earlier on, mm. uh, was in the squad as well. Well, sometimes young players have got to almost break into the team, force their way in. And the way you do that is is through the, like, the youth level football and make sure that when you're in the kind of under 19s and stuff that you're you're really putting in strong, solid performances. You can make that step up to train with the first team. This is a Harry Amas is a good example. Um, do you know what it is, Scott? Like going to the game again, going to the Liverpool match, that was, that was all I had in my head was that you've just beaten Liverpool's academy 9-1 on their own patch, by the way, in Merseyside. You know, you've done that away from home. You've been riding high all season, you know, kind of favourites to win the league uh, at that level, which is a big jump for United. I said only two or three years ago, and they said you won the, the Youth Cup, but it wasn't really good set up, being honest. Behind that, like two years before that, United were, were pretty bad. Um, so you've built something over a four or five year period. So there's almost like a blueprint there already existing about how you apply it to the first team to build something over three or four or five years. Now, a lot of these young lads, Scott, these these guys are your future. And going to the Liverpool game, I was thinking, you've won nine one. You've almost got to be like bulletproof to this scenario. It's like Liverpool are after a title and we're not. But down the road, we'll see you again. Don't worry. We've got these lads now in the locker. Somewhere down the line, we will see you again, yeah? And we will be a different team. And that's how I felt. And I was like, we lose, fine. Might have a different manager next year. That's okay. Ten of might remain. That's all right as well. But these lads have got it and they're going to give it. And it also reminded me of another thing where a coach, I spoke to a coach who um, who's working youth football, and this is a while ago, and he was around when uh, the Class 92 broke through. And I think I think he was at, was it Preston or somewhere, and he said these lads turned up and we heard about them, you know the likes of Skulls and Butt and Beckham and all of this. He said, and it wasn't until they were on the pitch and they beat us eleven nil, we understood what it was. He was like, because you hear about kids all the time. Well, going to Liverpool and winning nine one is significant because you're making a point, making a statement. It's like we're better than you and we're going to hammer you and we're going to embarrass you, and that's what good teams do. So. But we've got that to come, Scott. That's the way I look at it. And that's why I feel quite, still feel very buoyant about the future because I think if uh, the transfer policy can be corrected by Ineos, you've got these young lads who, who are kind of on the cusp. You know, like they're still young. We shouldn't have expectations. But I think we can expect, Scott, they make the breakthrough. Look at Manu. Like it was only six months ago. Most Man United fans still didn't really know who he was. Most, you know, now everyone knows who he is can happen like that in youth football. Garnacho is exactly the same. Once the youth cup, people are like, ah, he's not ready to start. Yes, he is. He's ready to start. And this year he has started loads of games. There's plenty of these young lads in the academy here who have just got an elite talent, Scott. They are they are better than what we've got on 250 grand a week. That's the truth. So get rid of the high owners, bring the kids in. And if you lose with kids, at least you're moving forward towards something better. Don't want to brag, but we told you about that. <laughs> I, know. I get done for that all the time. People go, oh, you're bragging. It's like, no, I'm just trying to explain what we've said. <laughs> and you got also, to explain kind of... can, I, can I call this out, by the way? Go on. I, this has done my head in over the last few days, right? I have, and if you've listened to this podcast, Rob as well, right? We've been both quite defense, me, right, especially, has been quite defensive of Eric Ten Hag, right? Quite defensive. Mm. Give him time, give him time. The one day I say, Right. Okay. Might need to start expecting a little bit more than this. Otherwise, he's going to lose his job. No, I'm one. <laughs> uh, my, my Twitter replies are just full of, oh, well, you, you're blaming the manager now. Are you, why are you blaming the manager for? I was like, listen mm. to what I'm saying. Like, it's just been an entire like year where I've been trying to defend him and like being symp sympathetic to what his situation is. Yeah. And now it's, oh, well, you're not giving the manager a chance. Oh, come on, guys. Come on, honestly. Okay. And, and I remain, like you, I still remain sympathetic to Eric. And, and as I just said a minute ago, if they say, if Ineos go, do you know what? We're going to stick with Eric and we're going to pump the money into the team and correct the transfer policy. I'm still all right with it. I'll live with it. Do you know what I mean? Because he probably does deserve some extra time, but it's more about maybe the things he isn't doing in, in the last few months. That's the part of the problem here, isn't it, with, with Eric? Um, you said with these young kids, I, I, don't, I don't actually have just in this moment kind of faith that he will go to the kids in future i think he still does like 
certain amounts, his his players or how it is, and that's how he goes. Um, maybe we do need a coach that actually looks towards youth a little bit more. Like, I'm not talking about grandpa, but I'm talking about someone like that who is more of a tracksuit manager and does those kind of things. Now, Eric was supposed to be that. That's what we wanted him for. And I think he's almost been forced to play Cobby. Like, I don't think, I think Cobby's made him play him. And maybe now you will see it with Willie. Maybe Willie's the guy who's going to come in and force his way in. But I think we've uh, with Eric, we, we've supported him all the way, Scott, and, and I'm not having it. Like people are having a go at us, but I think that's also just Twitter. Like, I, you know, people telling me you don't know the rules, you don't know anything about football, you don't know it, and it's fine because that's your right to just say all of that, and that's all good. But I think that's why sometimes we try and explain this and say, well, we have said this six months ago, and that's why this tweet that we put out, <laughs> which shows it, not trying to brag about it. You tried to make me retweet that thing about Garnacho and Ronaldo the other day, and I said no, because it's just that, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's like we compare like these things because people, it's so polarizing, isn't it? What I actually said was obviously at the time with Garnacho is that he's more mature than Ronaldo was at this age, and I still believe that. I'll stick by that. I think Garnacho might be a player of the year, Scott. I don't know about what you think about that. So these young players, Scott, I think are giving us good value this year, and I think we've got more to come. That feels good to me. Final section of the show today, Rob, you've uh, provided some quotes from Casemiro, mm. who has said in the aftermath of that game to ESPN Brazil. This this is what I quote. It's difficult. This is the point that bothers me most about not fighting for titles, being 20 points behind first place. Sometimes I can't even sleep to try to think about doing something different. It's reality. There's no point in thinking about title or Champions League places. We need to think about today's games. Mm. We need to think about the day-to-day. -day. We had the opportunity to score nine points in the last few games when we scored two. We were upset. We had to t uh, think game by game and focus on the next match against Bournemouth. You, you provided that quote. Mm. Why... What what did you take from take out of it? Because I think Casemiro is an interesting case. Like I, I think we can again kind of drill into the numbers or just look at the eye eye test on on the player, and I think we can sometimes get carried away in the fact that you know because he can't run around and doesn't have maybe the athleticism of what we've said in the past that it doesn't hurt. Casemiro is hurting just like all of them, and this is why I give pre players credit for that because there might be some players who want big money and just go oh well. Maybe Casemiro has thought that in some weeks, but I do think that these guys look at it and and the dysfunction that's run through the team this year that they don't like it. And I said that actually at the stadium yesterday when I was having a chat with someone about a similar scenario around tactics and about the team is that I get the feeling about the players quite often that things that are being instructed to do they just don't really like it half the time. Like playing mad transition football, I think most of them are like, "Hang on, this is not the way we're supposed to play football." Like Casemiro must be thinking, "Hang on a second. I've played as a six in the pivot for years and my job has been just to give the ball to someone and then you build and you, you build play up and that's that." So, I think that quote was quite interesting because I don't think Casemiro will be there next year at the football club. I do think that Casemiro is finished as a kind of Premier League entity almost as quick as it began. But I also think that that I don't but I do, I do have like I do have sympathy for them, and I don't have sympathy for the tactics. So I think when you look at Eric, that I think that's maybe where he's not got the most out of these players because I think last year some things worked, this year it hasn't. I think with Casemiro, you saw as well against Liverpool, Scott, like some of the times where the holes in midfield they are frightening, but we've now become accustomed to being frightened. And that's not good look either. <laughs> you shouldn't just expect these chasms in midfield to be open. And we kind of now just go. Okay, this is what what it is, isn't it? Whereas maybe I think six months ago we were going, "What the hell are we watching? This is mad. This is mad football. It's still mad football." But I think that quote from Casemiro shows that he knows it's mad football. They all know it's mad football, and something will have to change at some point. Yeah, I th I think that most people now are just uh, accustomed to this, and maybe from my perspective, obviously the things to play for this season outside of the FA Cup are essentially gone, mm. unless you count. Europa League qualification is something to play for. I mean, that, that should be well, believe, well beneath what you know United aspire to. Yeah, I even have issues with like Champions League qualification, like aiming to get into that. You know, you come from United who won thirteen Premier League titles. The aspiration is a bare changed. minimum. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a bare minimum exactly. Mm. But <clears throat> I think you can see change that is on the horizon. Maybe with uh, obviously the the new people coming in upstairs. Yeah. Uh, Sir Jim and Brailsford and all of the people that they will employ, Ashworth, uh, Wilcox, etc., etc. Barada's coming in as well. You know, 
this will take time. Obviously, now would have been it would have been ideal if we were going into a new season next year and a new era, essentially, as or in a better position than United are. Mm. But I think for me is I'm just looking at the long game in a sense, and you know, things the decisions need to be made, but getting getting lost and carried away in the emotion of and maybe it's not a nice way to look at football, maybe, but like that's just where United are for me at, at, this, at this moment. It's I know what I'm going to get, and there's no point getting stressed out about it. <laughs> that's why I laugh at it most of the time. Yeah, I, I'm with you 100%, and I think this is why the, we talk about don't get too high, don't get too low, say every show, is that you just said there about the long game. I think that's literally all you can do is look long. The questions have changed, though, Scott, when we look long. And now that question in the last few weeks and months, which has manifested, especially on our show here, is, is Eric Tenon the correct guy to take you down that long road? Because it is a long road. And I think that's where, you know, Ineos are going to earn their money one way or the other here. Is, you know, I had two, three people say to me yesterday, it's uh, Old Trafford, I talked about Ineos, and they were like, what have they done? What have Ineos done so far? And it's like, quite a lot like I, you know, I know like it doesn't feel like it because we're watching this dross on a football pitch and we've watched it all season long but I actually think that they I don't think they're stupid I think they actually look at it and kind of go no we need to find tangible change that we can measure stuff by because that's that's what United don't have at the moment you can't really measure performances by any real things you've got, got no barometer so that's where we are with Eric and I think that's where the football club is Again, so in that same conversation, someone said to me, oh, but it's just no no good coaches out there. And I'm like, there's always good coaches. There's always someone out there that maybe we don't talk about, but there's always someone out there that maybe could take your project from here to there. When Arsenal went and got Arteta, Scott, he certainly wasn't the top name on people's lips at that time because he was the guy that, you know, picked the bottles up for Guardiola at City. You know, that's kind of how it was. But people knew that maybe he had something that if he had time to develop it, he's done that at Arsenal, hasn't he? So credit to him. I think with Eric now, if he does survive into next season, Scott, we need to see a lot more, don't we? We need to go into pre-season and we need to see something that, that resembles a personality in his team because at the moment, the only personality Man United have got is chaotic. It's just chaos. It's not football that wins you championships. Nate, we haven't talked about Thiago Mossi. Sorry, was a link with United over the weekend. That's for another is day. He going to, is he going to Juventus? Is that, is that, I, I, yeah, I have is seen that where it's suggestions. Gone? I'm not entirely sure, but maybe uh, it, maybe this that's for another day. But yeah, I think that's that's where we'll wrap it. Uh, long, I'd be remiss to not to do this. Long-term storytelling, et cetera, et cetera. Rob and I just uh, got a load of WrestleMania last night. Fantastic. And that that's that, that's long term storytelling, right? Oh yeah, I caught up on it all. Just I caught up with it today as well, and looking at the, some of the interviews and stuff like that. And it's uh, yeah, it, Man United are a little bit like WWE, aren't they? It's all a little bit. It's a little bit like that. Kind of you, you know how it's probably going to go, but is it entertaining? Well, I don't know, Man United. I want them to play more football, Scott. As I said last week, I love basketball. I don't want Man United to be a basketball team. <laughs> I'm a Celtics fan, so I'm obviously very happy at the moment with the NBA. But I, I think that's it with United. Is to The storytelling here, can Man United finish the story, Scott? Can Eric Ten Hag get to where he needs to be to finish his story? Uh, unfortunately, at the moment, I, I, I'm not believing it yet. But I'd like to be proved wrong. I would love to, I'd love for it to next year for him to go into next season and maybe get some different players. Do you know one extra point, Scott, I'm going to make just before we go, is that for his little three cameos that he's had, I like what Mason Mount's doing. Just I don't just the little things. He does the little things really well in a way that we haven't seen anyone do this season. And I can see now why at the start of the season, Eric was playing him as the 10. Because we were like, hang on a second. Why is Bruno deeper? Surely it should be the other way around. Bruno should be the 10. I actually think Mount is a lot more aggressive in kind of straight line press, but also more tactical in, in what he does with the ball and moves it around to keep possession. I think uh, Mason Mount might be someone towards the end of the season and going into next year that could help Man United a lot in terms of their own identity. Maybe Fingers we'll crossed. talk about that later this week, but uh, that has been it from us on The Promise Land today. Subscribe to our audio show on Apple and Spotify and give us a five-star review as well if you would please. Watch us on YouTube where you can like the stream Subscribe and leave a comment. Hit the notification bell so you never miss a show as well. The Promise and a Manchester United podcast is where you can find us in the search bar. And follow us on social media at double underscore Scott Saunders on X Instagram, TikTok at underscore Rob underscore B on X and YouTube and at TPLMUFC 
on X as well from Rob and from myself. That's it for today. We'll be back later this week to look ahead to the game against Bournemouth. And uh, whatever happens in between, we'll, we'll talk about it as well. But until next time, from Scott and Rob, thanks very much for listening, everyone. This has been the Promised Land podcast. Until next time, have a fantastic week. <laughs>